With that said, I'm going to invite Pastor Mike to come. Pastor Mike, uh, you, you hear from Mike every day almost if you, um, if you do our devotions. You can applaud for that. It's, I am continually blessed and amazed with what Mike does. Uh, and so Pastor Mike's going to be taking us through Nehemiah chapter 4. Uh, if you weren't here last week and you want to hear that message about the Vineyard DNA groups, it's on our website. It's chapter 3. I would encourage you to do so. So thank you, thank you. Brother Mike. Here we go. Ah, good morning. You know, it just struck me sitting there. Um, delivering a sermon is a lot like having a baby, but you do the labor. And afterwards, you want to slap me. <laughs> I'm going to be happy to deliver this baby, actually. I, I've enjoyed this so much. I mean, this, and this is this would just be a, a proviso, a caveat up front. You know, I, I woke up, um, you know, I, I think I, I managed to get to bed, I don't know, fall asleep, I should say, sometime by 1, and I woke up, woke up again at 3.30 and um, tried for 30 minutes to, to go back to sleep, just wasn't happening. Got up, read 10 chapters of Leviticus, still didn't go to sleep. <laughs> I, however, did not think about actually listening to my own podcast. That might have worked. <laughs> but anyway... Um, glad you're here. Oh, let's see. Kevin. Kev Kevin here? I, yes, I saw you. Okay, just a minute. Just got to take care of something because otherwise I'll forget. Your, your um, office manager. I told her I'd get her those. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. All right. I told you. Caveat. <laughs> you realize that it's not only Super Bowl Sunday, and there is a point... For me, dressed like this, it's not just random. Notice I said not just random. Uh, there is a point to it. Um, no, it's not Obi-Wan. No, there's no lightsaber. No, you haven't come into a cosplay convention. It's just every once in a while, it's good to put on a friar's frock. It's like Friar Frock Sunday for me. But there is a point. There's a point to it. Um, one of the, the mentors of the past I've been leaning into increasingly over the last number of years is St. Francis. I don't know if there's any coincidence or any divine indication as to how the coin may flip today at this, this great cultural event known as the Super Bowl, but San Francisco, yeah, uh, I, I just don't know. <laughs> Time will tell. What else is today? Groundhog Day. Okay, fun fact, okay, fun fact. Uh, the website, What Culture? Combine various time duration assumptions and estimates that um, basically came up with a figure that Phil Connors in the movie Groundhog Day, Bill Murray, spent 12,395 12, days reliving the same day over and over again. 12,395 days, which is just under 34 years, just so you know. So what's going to happen, of course, is you all are going to wake up tomorrow at about, what is that, 11? 10.58. You're going to wake up at 10.58 and relive this sermon 12,395 times. <laughs> okay. We're in an old store today. And, and you know, here's the thing. I'm, I'm talking with Lindsay on, I don't know if it was Wednesday or Thursday, um, um, because I still have this kind of two-service thing in my head, so doing a PowerPoint, and typically we'll have the text that is in English, and then it would be like in, in, in Spanish, and then the second service would be in, in uh, Burmese, uh, to just to speak to the, the full audience present. And so I was saying, okay, so I sent you a PowerPoint, and... And, and so you transfer it into, you know, to get it set up for both services. It's like, oh, no, it's just one service. And so well, what's the language? What's the other language? And she said, uh, Swahili seems to, to, to be the most relevant at the moment. We're, we're doing Swahili currently. And this idea just entered my brain. It would be so cool. You know, we talk about, hey, we should all go visit the Swahili service sometime um, over, over in the chapel. And this is just me, but I think it would be awesome if the Swahilis did their service in here someday and we all just got to witness and participate. It would be amazing. Just me. Just me. And I have hardly had any sleep whatsoever, but that's just me. Um, but the thought was, wouldn't it be cool to have someone from the Swahili church just come up and read the passage for us in Swahili? 
That would be amazing. And so I, I shot a text to, to Chuki. Chuki, are you here? Are you going to do this? Where are you, Chuki? Ch oh, Chuki, come on, come on. All right. That was so cool that she said yes. That was amazing. So I gave, I gave her a high five. I don't know what that means in Swahili culture, but I gave her a high five. Um, so this is what we do. So you're not going to have a translation up on the board. Let the words wash over you. Okay? Just let them wash over you. Just listen to the voice of this daughter of God. Let her words wash over you. Then I shall translate and read English following. Then you can nod off, okay? Thank right. you. Thank you. Praise God. Yes. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to read in Swahili. Lakini ikawa wakati sabalati aliposikia ya kwamba tulijenga ukuta akakasirika sana kuhingiwa na uchungu sana akazihaki wa Yuda wakawafari wakafanya nini watajifanyizia boma watatoa zabiu watamaliza ukuta kwa siku moja wakafaha mawe katika mafungo ya jalala nayo yametetewa katika umoje basi Tobia muamoni akasikia karibu naye akasema hata hiki wanachokijenga kama mbwea angepanda angebomoa ukuta waho wa mawe utusikie e bwana wetu Mahana tunazaliliwa na Wayahudi. Mashutumu yao juu ya kichwa chao wenyewe na watoe ma, watekwa katika inji ya wa, washutumu wao juu ya kichwa chao wenyewe na watoe watekwa katika inji ya uamisho wala usifunike uovu wao wala zambi yao usifutwe mbele yako maana wametukazirisha mbele yao wanahojenga hivi tukajenge ukuta na ukuta wote ukasimamishwe pamoja mapako nusu ya urefu wako juu maana watu walikuwa na mawe Mahana watu walikuwa na moyo wa kufanya kazi na ilikuwa wakati sabalati na tobia na waarumbu na wa, wa amoni na walisaidiri waliposikia ya kwamba kutateneza kwa ukuta na Yerusalemu kuliendelea na ya kwamba pahali palipobomoka palihanzwa kuzibwa wakakasirika sana waho wote wakafanya shahuri pamoja kuja kupigana na Yerusalemu na kufanya machafuko ndani yake lakini tukahomba tuka, tuka Mungu wetu tukaweka walinzi juhu yao mchana na usiku kwa ajili yao Yuda akasema nguvu ya nguvu ya wawezi juu ya mchana na usiku kwa ajili yao Yuda akasema nguvu ya wenye kuchafuka mizigo imehoza na katakataka nyingi ni pale hata hatukuweza kujenga ukuta nao watesi wetu wakasema Hawata hawatajua wala kuhona hata tutakapokuja kati yao na kuwahua na kukakomesha kazi hii na ilikuwa wakati wayahudi waliokaa walio karibu nao walipokuja wakatuambia mara kumi kutoka pahali pote shurti murudi kwetu basi nikaweka watu kwa pahali pachini sana na nafasi iliyokuwa nyuma 
ya ukuta kwa pahali walipokuwa wazi nikaweka watu kwa jamaa zao pamoja na panga zao mikuki yao na pinga zao Nika, nikatazama na kusimama na kuwahambia wakubwa wa watawala na bakila za watu musiwa ogope mkumbuke bwana aliye mkubwa na mwenye kuogopesha na mupiganie ndugu zenu wana wenu na binti zenu na wake zenu na nyumba zenu na ilipokuwa wakati adui zetu waliposi, waliposikia ya kuwa tumekwisha kudia na ku, na ya kukua Mungu amehanzimisha amehanz, shurti lao sisi sote tukarudi kwa ukuta kila mmoja na kwa kazi yake na ilikuwa tokea wakati ule nusu ya watumishi wangu wakatenda, wakatenda kazi na nusu yao wakashika mikuki gabo na pinda na kuzo za, za chuma na watawala walikuwa nyuma ya nyumba yote ya Yuda wale waliojenga ukuta na wale waliochukua mizigo kila mmoja akatenda kazi kwa umoja na mikono yake na kwa mi, na kwa mwingine akashika silaha na we, wana, wanajeshi kila mmoja alikuwa na upanga wake umekasishika silaha na, waje, na wajengaji kila mmoja alikuwa na upanga wake umefungwa kwa ubavu wake wakajenga hivi naye aliyapiga barugumu alikuwa karibu naye nikawaambia wakubwa na watawala na wapaki wa watu kazi ni nyingi tena ni kubwa na tumesababishwa juu ya ukuta kila mtu mbali na mwenzake pahali wapi muposikia sauti ya baragumu muje pale karibu nasi Mungu wetu atatupigania na hivi tuka, tukatumike kazi na nusu ya walishika mikuki kutoka asubuhi kufika wakati nyota zilipotokea hivi vile vile kwa wakati ule nikawaambia watu kila mtu pamoja na mtumishi wake akae ndani ya Yerusalemu wapate kuwa walinzi wetu usiku na, ku, na kutumika kazi wakati wa mchana 23 basi mimi na ndugu zangu na watumishi wangu na watu wa ulinzi walionifuata hatuku hatuku dondosha nguo zetu kila mmoja akakwenda kwa maji pamoja na silaha yake Thank you Chiki Okay, next time Burmese. Cuz the same goes for the Korean, yeah. You know, I figure um, they have our language shooting past them all day long. It's kind of nice to have the tables turned just for a moment and just to enjoy. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, translation. English, approximate translation. Nehemiah chapter 4 we're in the midst of this series on Nehemiah which concerns a building project in an ancient narrative taking place some 2500 years ago the question of course then is what relevance could this possibly have for us um let's hear the text i'm reading from oh the message a little bit of me 
When Sam Ballard heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he exploded in anger, vilifying the Jews. In the company of his Samaritan cronies and military, he let loose. What are these miserable Jews doing? Do they think they can get everything back to normal overnight? Make building stones out of make-believe? At his side, Tobiah the Ammonite jumped in and said, that's right, what do they think they're building? Why, if a groundhog climbed that wall, it would fall to pieces under his weight. Nehemiah prayed, oh, listen to us, dear God. We are so despised, boomerang their ridicule on their heads, have their enemies cart them off as war trophies to a land of no return. Don't forgive their iniquity. Don't wipe away their sin. They've insulted the builders. We kept at it, repairing and rebuilding the wall. The whole wall was soon joined together and halfway to its intended height because the people had a heart for the work. When Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the repairs of the walls of Jerusalem were going so well that the breaks in the wall were being fixed, they were absolutely furious. They put their heads together and decided to fight against Jerusalem and create as much trouble as they could. We countered with prayer to our God and set a round-the-clock guard against them. But soon, well, this little ditty started making the rounds. The builders are pooped. The rubbish piles up. We're in over our heads. We can't build this wall. And all this time, our enemies were chiming in with their own tune. They won't know what hit them. Before they know it, we'll... They're gonna, we're going to be at their throats, killing them right and left. That will put a stop to the work. The Jews, who were their neighbors, kept reporting, they have us surrounded. They're going to attack. If we heard it once, we heard it ten times. So I stationed armed guards at the most vulnerable places of the wall and assigned people by families with their swords, lances, and bows. After looking things over, I stood up and spoke to the nobles, officials, and everyone else. Don't be afraid of them. Put your minds on the master, great and awesome, and then fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Our enemies learned that we knew all about their plan and that God had frustrated it. And we went back to the wall and went to work. And from then on, half of my young men worked while the other half stood guard with lances, shields, bows, and male armor. Military officers served as backup for everyone in Judah who was at work rebuilding the wall. The common laborers held a tool in one hand and a spear in the other. Each of the builders had a sword strapped to his side as he worked. I kept the trumpeter at my side to sound the alert. And then I spoke to the nobles and officials and everyone else. There's a lot of work going on and we're spread out all along the wall, separated from each other. When you hear the trumpet call, join us there. Our God will fight for us. And so we kept working. From first light until the stars came out, half of us holding lances. I also instructed the people, each person and his helpers, to stay inside Jerusalem, guards by day and workmen by night. We all slept in our clothes, I, my brothers, my workmen, and the guards backing me up. And each one kept his spear in his hand, even when getting water. The word of the Lord. So, to read the chapters actually to preach the lesson. I mean, if you're listening, you just heard it. You got it. But I am going to connect some dots. Okay, Jesus would tell stories publicly and would not explain them. And it was left for privately among his disciples. He went over everything. We're just, we're just combining the two at this point. Yeah? So just, uh, just a little bit. Hey, over there. Look at you guys. Wow. And this is Dottie, by the way. Dottie here. And, and she's going to have, she'll have something to say here in a bit. Um, thank you for joining us, Dottie. Um, what do we get from this 25-year, 2,500-year-old story about the building of ancient walls and swords and lances and trumpeters? I mean, what relevance could this possibly have for us? And, and if I, well, if we weren't streaming live, uh, what I would do at this point is I would show you a clip from O Brother or Art Thou, which would take about two minutes and the screen would go black, but I decided not to. I just memorized the bit instead, okay? My favorite bits of the movie, it's, um, it's when the three of them try to jump onto a train and, of course, unsuccessfully drop to the side. There's O Brother or Art Thou. You guys familiar with this? Okay, okay, good, good. If you haven't seen it, you just, you just need to. 
Okay. Anyway, um, one of my favorite scenes because as they're as, as they're taking a vote as to who's in charge of this here outfit, I'm thinking, wow, this is a scene of the one of the very things we're talking about this morning, which is the unity, because these are three who are chained together, and yet they're well. I vote for me. Well, I vote for yours truly too. And then of course you know the answer from the one in the middle. I'm with you fellers. Okay. All right. And then the sound of hounds in the distance, and then the creaking sound of something slowly moving along the tracks, and it's the old muse, all right? Join, right? Join, he says. And so they jump up, and now it's the blind muse. And his words actually give us, well, it gives us the title, frames the whole thing for us actually rather nicely, because he says, you seek a great treasure, you three who are now in chains. You will find a treasure, though it would not be the treasure you seek. But first, you must travel a long and difficult road, a road fraught with peril. Mm -hmm. You shall see things wonderful to tell. You shall see a cow on the roof of a cotton house. Ha! And also many startlements. I cannot tell you how long this road shall be, but do not fear the obstacles in your path, for fate has vouchsafed your reward. Though the road may wind, yea, and your hearts grow weary, still shall you follow the way, even unto your salvation. There we go. <laughs> Title for the sermon, yes, we have a Long and difficult road, a road fraught with peril. But do not fear the obstacles in your path. There's our time. What would we do with the obstacles? Any of you dealing with obstacles this morning? Is there a someone who is your obstacle? From microbes to men... What opposition are you facing? What obstacles are you encountering? And let's just establish this right up front. Is there anybody here currently, and this isn't to shame you, this is actually, this would make me actually very, very happy. Anyone in here right now that is not dealing with opposition or obstacles in your life? Really, it's okay. You might have just won, don't tell us you just won the lottery. That would not be wise. On several levels, that would not be wise. We all do. We all, obstacles, it's a reality of life. We live in a hard place. We live in a place in which the very ground resists us, yes? And we earn a living by the sweat of our brow, and we bear children with the same sweat and labor. This is a hard place. It's a hostile environment, Yes? And so, just in case you want to take my word for it, which you, that would be wisdom, we have two statements, one from Jesus and one from, I almost said one of his key henchmen, but that would have been totally the wrong word, his representative, Paul, former Rabbi Saul. Jesus said, in this world you will have what? Tribulation. All right? The word tribulation, the Greek word is thlipsis. Don't get too close to me when I say that because you will get a fountain of <laughs> expressiveness. All right? Thlipsis. Thlibo is the Greek word. Thlibo. Let me just tell you what this means. Thlibo. Oh, I should have brought something up here that would be nice to do this too, but then I'm in my bare feet. All right. Thlibo is this. It's what my foot is doing. And so far, no splinters. This is a good thing. Thlibo is to press and to crush dickens out of something. It was used of what's done to grapes under feet as you literally smash them to bits. It's what's used of olives in an olive press as you, as, as the donkey would pull that, that big millstone around and crack those olives again and again and again. And just when they think they're done, here it comes again. And we're not done yet because now all of that pulp is taken and placed into burlap sacks and stacked, and now we have what's called a Gethsemane put on top of it, large stone that just sits and presses and presses. And there, of course, 
containers gathering from each corner of this olive press, a Gethsemane. An olive press is the life is literally and slowly squeezed out of you. Jesus said, in the world, you're going to have lots of squeezing out of you. But then he said, be of good cheer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> be of good cheer. And what's the final line? I have overcome the world. We want to go to the final line. But you don't get to the final line until you pass through much squeezing. And that's the second word from Paul. This was his pep talk to believers as he backtracked in Acts 14. He had a message that was summarized in these succinct words. We must, notice, we may, no. Uh, many of you may, some of, no. We must enter the kingdom of God through many crushings, smashings, pulverizings. Tribulations. No wonder we have an eschatology that puts the tribulation seven years ahead. We're all raptured up before it happens. It happens to the people left behind. And the message of Jesus is, of course, very simply, you're all left behind. You're all that crowd as you're being pressed. And Paul says, we glory not only in God, but in our thlipsises, in our Crushings, knowing that crushings have the precious oil that comes out of it. Crushings produce endurance, and endurance, hope, and hope, character. So I don't want to belabor the point, but um, they're, they're, go ahead and put that slide up again with a picture, because I think if they show the picture, yeah, that's actually a sheriff's badge. That's a scene from 1969's um, Support Your Local Sheriff, James Garner, Harry Morgan, Joan Hackett, Jack Elam. Uh, great classic comedy western, um, and James Garner is is a gunfighter. They're trying to recruit to be their sheriff to to deal with the local family of baddies. That I think is one of the last film Walter Brennan was in. Uh, actually, he's like the the patriarch of this family that's oppressing the town. And James Garner finally says okay, improves his his skill with a gun, and then they say okay, you're hired. And he says, is there a badge that goes with this job? And Harry Morgan, who's the mayor, goes, oh, yes, there is. And he walks over, you know, runs over, actually, trots over to the drawer, opens it, and pulls out this badge, hands it to James Garner. James Garner holds it, and those are James Garner's hands right there. And he says, well, this was a lucky badge for the last fellow who, who wore it. Looks like it saved his life. To which Harry Morgan says, well, it sure would have if it hadn't been from all those other bullets coming at him from everywhere. <laughs> I've had more occasions than one in my life, particularly in the last few years. It's like, oh, that's a scene that comes to me. I'm at a, I'm at a dance, you know, line dance class on Wednesday night, and, and I, can't, I can't even, let's not even bother with my litany of, of it, but it's just like it's all there. And it's, it's a point which I don't even know what to worry about anymore. And it's just like, there's so many bullets. All right, the shield of faith is like a badge. Boom, <laughs> it caught one of them. But what about all the others that seem to be finding their mark? All right, this is where we live. Yes? This is where we live. And so you know what I decided at that moment? I entered back into the line dance lesson and said, if I don't know what to worry about, then I just don't have the luxury of worrying about any of it. You could say it's, you could say it's denial. And if so, just leave me alone. <laughs> Let me have my denial. But I think it's something deeper. All right. What do we do when we encounter obstacles and opponents. All right, and I have four. They're, they're four quickies, really. They are. They're really four quickies. Um, oh, okay, I, did, I, did, I couldn't help it. I, I put in two slides. Luane and I were out with friends eating last Sunday night. It was a Mongolian barbecue in Meridian. And okay, the, 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 the first slide, the first fortune was mine, which um, your path may be difficult, but will be rewarding. Okay, thank you for describing my life. That's a description, not a fortune. Try again. This was hers. You will overcome difficult times. It's like, 
you can't get away from it in a Mongolian barbecue. It's there in your cookies. Which immediately brought to mind the classic Far Side cartoon, Bummer of a Birthmark, Hal. Yeah. Bummer. And you all have it. You all have it. There you go. All. We all have it. Yeah? We also have something else. It's, it's, called, it's called the mark of God on our foreheads as we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Yes? That's indelible. And it actually, that birthmark, that target that's on us, um, it actually just makes the other, it makes it glisten and deepen. Um, like a bruise. <laughs> okay. How do we handle? How do we handle the obstacles that come? There is a big comprehensive Jesus answer we could give, which I would say, well, how did Jesus deal with opposition and opponents? All the evil coming at him? Okay, this is the, the comprehensive Jesus answer. Stretch out your arms and absorb it, thereby dying. And through your death, change the world as you practice resurrection. That's the comprehensive answer. Nehemiah has something much more practical for us, because you're probably looking at that and, yeah. <laughs> oh, great, thanks. <laughs> Absorb it. Yeah, thanks. Okay, that's, uh, okay. Four quickies, okay? Uh, they're all right there in the text. In fact, I had it bolded. Uh, if you were looking at the screen as you were reading, I had all these different statements bolded. All right, number one, what do we do? Well, we pray. It's just, it's just a four-letter word. Don't be afraid of it. Pray. Nehemiah prayed. They ridiculed. He prayed. They ridiculed more, and the people are falling apart. They countered with prayer. All right, prayer has impact. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. Yeah? And it didn't rain for three and a half years. Then he prayed again. Heaven gave its rain. Earth produced its fruit. Prayer accomplishes things. It can change the weather. Right? Of course, nobody else was happy as prayer was answered. All of them were dying of thirst. That's the funny thing about prayer. One person's answer is another's curse. Yeah? Prayer, is in, prayer impacts more than just the weather, people. Prayer is not just about changing your circumstances. You might have noticed this because you pray against them and it's just like, they won't leave. Or if they do, they boomerang back on you. And we understand Nehemiah's prayer. Lord, let it boomerang back on them and just... Mm, there it is. And they go to the land of no return. So I, I, th I think we hear that prayer. But prayer uh, impacts us probably most significantly by molding and shaping and reshaping our perspective and widening the angle so we get beyond the immediate and we can see the bigger picture. Um, and that bigger picture is just filled with more pain. Okay, thank you, God. Um, but this is Philippians 4. Right? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say it, rejoice. Um, let your gentleness be known to all. The Lord is near. In nothing be anxious, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And what? And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will what? Guard. I see we have guards in Nehemiah with swords and lances. These are only guards you need, people. Peace of God that will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul did not write this as he was vacationing in Barbados. All right, he wrote this after being free for 20 years to travel wherever he wanted to go and experience all of his adventures, which involved shipwrecks and beatings and stonings. Okay, that's 2 Corinthians 11, his own litany. But he was free. All right. Now he's chained. Two years waiting, chained to a guard around the clock in a dingy Roman flat, waiting for his appearance before the madman who was running the world at that time. And he says, finally, my brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if there's anything excellent or praiseworthy, that's what you mark down in your soul. That's the ditty that you sing. That's your tune. 
It's not denial, it's just what you choose to see and to inscribe and have inscribed here. And then he says, whatever you have heard or received or learned from me, um, put it into practice, which goes to our second point. It's the wedding of prayer and practice. They go together. They are wedded. And so where God is joined, let no one separate. They might have various emphasis, but Nehemiah so beautifully balances the two. And so we have, uh, well, repeated statements here. We counted them with prayer and just one letter in the Hebrew, letter Vav, but it's huge. We counted them with prayer and we set a guard. Each of the builders had a sword strapped to his side as he worked. We kept working. And when I saw this resolution, people had a heart for the work. And so they just, they went right back at it and they kept going at it. And Nehemiah kept supporting them and they saw visible supports. I just immediately saw this picture, okay? Picture, this is uh, Ulysses S. Grant, all right? Um, and this is the statement uh, about him. I think you can kind of see it. This is actually 1864, uh, the Wilderness Campaign, uh, which was yet another bloodbath in our bloody civil war. And, and one, of his, one of his colleagues observed at this time that Grant is a man of a good deal of rough dignity, Rather taciturn, that is, he's not a blah, 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 so he wasn't a preacher, all right? Um, quick and decided in speech. So when he had something to say, he said it. Again, not a preacher. Um, he habitually wears an expression as if he had determined to drive his head through a wall and was about to do it. That sounds like Nehemiah territory to me. I love that Nehemiah's name means comfort. <laughs> He was hard as nails, a comfort. We do what we can do. You pray, you do what you can do, and then you trust for what God can do. All right. Put your minds on the master, Nehemiah said, great and awesome. God frustrated their plan. Our God will fight for us. I want to get the same passage in Philippians from the message. I actually had... All right, just remember back glorious days of yesteryear. What would, what would that have been? 2008, uh, right after Barack Obama became president, there was, there was an old woman uh, that I had had frequent conversations. This is back when I was doing the bookstore before my daughter just like kicked me out. Um, um, Rihanna, God bless her, just she's replaced me. Uh, but anyway, um, I'm actually quite happy about that. This is sweet. Thank you, Rihanna. God bless you. Yeah. All on Z? Okay. Um, this woman came in trembling, and she had boxes of books. And I said, so, you know, what, what's going on? And she said, they're coming for us. They're coming for us. I mean, she was literally, it was, it was like I could hear the palpitations from her chest. Um, I, I mean, and, and she was trembling. I mean, seriously, so in the book, she, she's trembling. I said, they're coming for us. Yes, the railroad cars are ready. They're coming for us. They're coming for us. I'm, I am going underground. I'm getting rid of everything. I thought you could use the books. And so I just, took, I just took her two hands in mine. Just took her two hands in mine. And um, I think this was, uh, I had a lot of my office out there at this point. And I actually just opened it to Peterson's rendition. And I just read this, celebrate God all day. Every day, I mean, revel in him. Make it as clear as you can to all you meet that you're on their side, working with them and not against them. That's Peterson's rendition of gentleness, which literally in Greek means a soft touch. Let your soft touch be evident everywhere because God's fingerprints are visible everywhere. So you don't have to push. Yeah? And so I'm just reading this. Help them see the master is about to arrive. He could show up any minute. That's who's coming for you. My, my dear, that's who's coming for you, sister. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. And before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. She did this with her eyes closed. I said I was going to pray, and then I just cheated and read the text. Um... Pray, do what you can, 
trust God for what God can. And then the fourth, don't go into a bunker. Go into a band. Band together. Okay, that's the fourth application. It's just, it's just all right there. Nehemiah 4, four points of application. It was just like too easy. Band together. We're spread out. Trevor mentioned last week, a mile, what was that? mile and a half is, is basically they're spread out along the wall over this radius. And so we are spread out. When you hear the trumpet call, join us there. Each person and his helper. I, my brothers, my workmen, and the guards backing me up. And I'll leave it to you to go back and, and read Ecclesiastes 4. Two are better than one, for they have a good return from their labor. Can you find a third? Bring them in. Three, four cord, not quickly broken. It's just wisdom. And so we need each other. And we're meant to band together as a community. Get out of our little isolated hovels and band together. We are an isolation culture. Individualistic, individualized, isolating. Band together. I have a fifth. And can I, can I just tell you a quick story? Just a quick story, OK? And this gets to, this gets to the point of my habit. I'm just going to sit down and tell you a story. Oh, because my fifth application outside of Nehemiah would be, uh, would be very simply try doing what Jesus did. That seems almost unachievable. He's like the son of God. That's cheating. So how about we try perhaps one of the ones who embodied Jesus best, embodied the Sermon on the Mount most clearly by how he lived, and that would be St. Francis. All right, it was, it was during, it was about 12... 20, year 1220, early 13th century, Italian town of Gubbio. St. Francis had taken up residence in Gubbio, and soon they began getting reports of a very large wolf that was preying on the countryside, killing livestock and starting to attack people. And so the people watched from the walls. All right, here's our, here's our application. Parallel to the story, they start watching from the walls. Whenever they caught sight of this wolf, they, you know, they just shrieked in terror, and everybody, because any, anybody who tried to hunt down the wolf ended up killed and devoured. And his lair was just over in the countryside, a little ways. Saint Francis, hearing the commotion, said, "I need to go out and have a word with this wolf." And they said, "You're crazy." He said, "Monk." Yes, of course I'm crazy. But I'm going to go out. He went to the gate. They opened the gates. He made the sign of the cross and proceeded. There was a group of men that followed from a distance, shaking in their boots, if they were wearing boots. And then Francis approached the lair of the beast. The men stopped at a distance, but yet they were able to hear what transpired. And the wolf emerged. Jaws opened, mouth ready to pounce. Francis made the sign of the cross and said, Stop! Enough! And the wolf stopped. And I think Francis then said, Come here. And the wolf came and laid its mouth in Francis' outstretched arms. Now you're saying, this is fantastical. This didn't happen. This is just made up. It's Catholic storytelling. And, you know, I also have a story to tell you about a snake talking in a tree and about birds that fed a runaway prophet during a famine. Right? There are impossible things that happen, people. Or do we believe this stuff about prayer? Or do we just like to talk about it? Francis, looking into the eyes of the beast, said, Brother Wolf, Thou hast done much evil in this land, destroying and killing the creatures of God without permission. Yea, not animals only hast thou destroyed, but thou hast even dared to devour men made in the image of God, for which thing thou art worthy of being hanged like a robber and a murderer. All men cry out against thee, the dogs pursue thee, and all the inhabitants of this city are thy enemies. But I will make peace between them and thee, O brother wolf, if so be thou no more offend them, and they shall forgive thee all thy past offenses, and neither men nor 
nor dogs shall pursue thee any more. And the wolf then backed and bowed its head. Francis extended his hand. He said, as thou art willing to make this peace, I promise thee that thou shalt be fed every day by the inhabitants of this land. So long as thou shalt live among them, thou shalt no longer suffer hunger as it is hunger that has made thee do so much evil. But if I obtain all this for thee, thou must promise on thy side never again to attack any animal or any human being. Dost thou make this promise? And the wolf placed its paw in Francis' hand. And he said, good. Now he said, come with me. And the wolf followed him into town. People, of course, not believing. The ferocious beast loose on the countryside was acting like St. Francis' pet. Into the center of the town, he came with a wolf, the wolf sitting right by him, and he preached one of the best, well, he actually didn't have to preach a really long, the sermon was right there in front of them. The whole town experienced, okay, revival. That would probably be a revival of sorts. Francis repeated the promise. Once again, Paul was extended. And the wolf lived in that town for two years, going from house to house, people feeding it, children playing with it. Wow, that is as fantastical as Isaiah chapter 11, isn't it? Fantastical. Such things possible. It's an example of how we deal with our obstacles. That gets back to the this, yeah? Now, side note, follow-up. In 1872, excavations in Gubbio, discovered by the church, buried beneath a slab, skeleton of a very, very large wolf, which they then took and buried outside of the town. Um, we have alternatives. All right. Nehemiah teaches us, Jesus teaches us more. Amen? Okay. All right. Now, Trevor shared a picture that Dottie gave to her last week. And, and yeah, so this one, which is very much pertinent right there in the middle. Um, you don't need to worry about your opponent. Okay. Um, and so I actually, the week before that sermon, I just thought I'd love to have somebody paint Jesse Nilo's, well, she's doing a Sundance someplace, I think down in Salt Lake City or something. And so Oh, let's, let's get dotty. Let's get dotty. So it was you know, Thursday before last Sunday, and then it's like, oh, there's dotty stuff up there. Dotty speaks through what she, through what she um, paints as well as through what she says. And I've got something she gave me, oh, probably about 10 years ago, um, uh, right there over my desk, and it still speaks. So, so Dottie, I'm going to give you this. Now, I've been bad. Well, everybody's been bad today, but um, go ahead and just take a minute. Okay. All right, so I was praying over this text, and I just sensed the word unity. And the word unity was brought together with bricks on a wall and stones. And the Lord was just saying opposition. I want you to think about what opposition means. And I saw the mortar being thrown at each one of us. And some of us, it was hitting our face. It was hitting all places on us. And it was weighing us down. And those are the lies that the enemy wants us to believe about ourselves and about where we are. And what Jesus wants us to do is he wants us first to make a decision. What do I want to do with this mortar? Do I want to let it dry and weigh me down? Or do I want to take it off my face or let Jesus or the Holy Spirit or Father God take it off my face, put it on that wall, and say, get another stone? Opposition means he speaks out the opposite, guys. Whatever he is saying, you are not worthy. 
you don't belong here, whatever it is, that means the opposite is true. I am worthy. I am loved. I am cared for. And as much as he wants us to come together in unity with one another, what he says first, be unified with us. Come to know the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because when he comes, sometimes we think he's just going to come and go, do you see this junk on you? Do you see this? I am holy and I can't stand this. No. He says with joy, set before him, let me help you with this. Because my son and my daughter, this doesn't belong on you. And the only weight I want on you is my glory. Amen. That's all the weight I want you to walk around in. So today, whatever you want to do, maybe you have some mortar that is dried. And right now, your stomach is just hurting. Maybe you've got some tears rolling down your cheeks because you know he's saying, this doesn't belong on you. What do you want to do with it? This doesn't belong here. Be unified in me and be unified with one another. That is the whole message from start to finish of the word of God. And that is what we have a choice to do today. Amen. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. Uh, Dottie just sounded a trumpet. I know you're hungry. My apologies. I wish it was like 15, 17 minutes sooner right now. Actually, about 27 minutes sooner. I wish it was. But we have real food and real drink. Okay. Um, Nehemiah sounded the trumpet. Everyone gathered to the same place. And so what we have is we have communion at you know, four stations on this side, four stations on this side. This is how I'd like to do this this morning. Um, I would love for us to, to get up. And it's an invitation. You don't, I, I'd like you to come whether you take of the elements or not. love you to, to come because we're going to band together in one place. And, and um, so don't go back to your separate places. Don't go back and take it individually. We actually want to stand together. We'll just line the whole front uh, from, from one wing all the way to, to the other and just get the elements and hold them. Okay? And... And so you're, you're going to have something to eat and sink your teeth into now, yeah? Okay, so let's go ahead and, and just get up. Three stations here. Well, actually, you know, three against the wall, one there. Just move, gather the elements, hold on to them. I would just ask you again just to stay huddled up here. Maybe after you gather them, move to the side so others can come. There we go. I'm going to read these words as as you get the elements this morning. This is the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. When we drink the cup of blessing, aren't we taking into ourselves the blood, the very life of Christ? And isn't it the same with the loaf of bread we break and eat? Don't we eat, don't we take into ourselves the body, the very life of Christ? Because there is one loaf, our manyness becomes oneness. Christ doesn't become fragmented in us. Rather, we become unified in him. We don't reduce Christ to what we are. He raises us to what he is. As you have the, the elements, those who can see them, I've got words up on the screen. I'm going to read. Just repeat after me, okay? Just repeat after me. 
And at the conclusion, you eat, you drink. Those of you who need ministry and prayer, you can stay. Um, um, if you need to go, you can go. This is a classic prayer attributed to St. Francis. So I'm just going gonna, gonna to say a line. You repeat after me, yeah? Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. And this, my brothers and sisters, is how we fight our battles. Let's take together. There's a table that you've prepared for me In the presence of my This is how I fight my battles. Oh, this Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance. Go be a channel of blessing. Amen. God bless these, your gathered children, and use them. In your glory, we ask through Christ. Amen. Hey Mike, we have some words for prayer. Oh, yeah, go for it. Yes. We have words for prayer. Yeah. yeah you can say it. Just tell them. Oh, yeah. There's words for prayer. They will magically appear on screens. If God has something for you and you sense, I need prayer this morning, if it's not there, well, you can still be here. Because we'll be here. We'll pray for you. God bless you all.